it is a great pleasure to take part in this uh, global webinar series. So Anatoly, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk um, and, and present my ongoing research uh, about Russia's role in higher education in Central Asia, and in particular, how um, this role is viewed uh, in two countries in Central Asia, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So it, it's wonderful to, to have this opportunity to uh, uh, in front of uh, all you there, the virtual uh, audience, um, of course, I'm a scholars, experts in international higher education. So my name is Sirke Mäkinen, and as Anatoly mentioned, I am I'm based at the Alexander Institute, the University of Helsinki, Finland, and the Alexander Institute is um, an area studies institute focusing on Eastern Europe and, and Eurasia. And as Anatoly mentioned, I am a political scientist by uh, training. And before joining uh, the University of Helsinki in, in 2019, um, I had worked for uh, years in the degree program of politics uh, at the University of Tampere, uh, Finland. So we can have the next uh, slide. So uh, here you can see, if we scroll down a bit, you can see what I plan to talk uh, about today. So uh, first I will say a few words about my previous research on international higher education and its link with uh, geopolitics or international politics or foreign policy. And in particular, I will introduce some findings um, that are relevant for uh, my um, uh, for my um, ongoing research. Uh, findings that I draw on uh, in, in, in the also in the ongoing research. Uh, so I will say a few words about what I have termed as Russia's education diplomacy and how it is or was uh, perceived in the so-called target countries. Uh, then I will talk about the research agenda for my current research. Uh, as I said, about changes in Russia's role uh, as a higher education provider. Uh, first, how Russia or Russian authorities represent uh, this role, and then how it is uh, perceived in, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And I, I want to stress uh, that uh, even though uh, the title says Central Asia, uh, I do not look at the region as a whole uh, in, in this presentation, and, and I'm also aware um, that um, uh, that there are differences between different countries in, in, in Central Asia. So uh, what I say about uh, Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan uh, cannot necessarily, necessarily be applied uh, to, for example, uh, Uzbekistan or Tajikistan. And then uh, after uh, presenting my research agenda, I will move to my uh, preliminary findings um, on whether there has been a change, and if yes, what kind of change. And then to conclude, I will um, present some uh, uh, thoughts and, and also um, mention how to continue my, my research. Okay, and then we can move on. So about my previous research. Uh, you can see here a list of publications which address in international higher education and, and uh, international collaboration in the field of higher education. And what I have emphasized uh, is the link between international higher education and international politics or state-to-state uh, -state relations. For example, I have studied uh, how, uh, on the one hand, uh, Russia try to integrate uh, with, with the uh, European partners, and on the other hand, how um, it, it tried to boost its image, uh, its uh, geopolitical influence um, with the help of, um, for example, with the help of uh, international higher education. So I have addressed uh, EU-Russia relations, uh, from the point of view of collaboration in education and research, and also competition. And uh, then I have looked at how Russia has tried to um, improve its status uh, in, in global higher education, for example, from the point of view of uh, uh, 
um, their aspirations related to global university rankings. And I have pulled it here with red, um, those uh, publications that are most relevant uh, for my ongoing research. And they discuss Russia's education diplomacy, uh, how Russia has used higher education in its foreign policy and how it has been uh, perceived in the EU and in the post-Soviet space. And we can look at the next slide, please. So my uh, ongoing research uh, partly builds on my previous studies. And, and what it means is that when I compare the situation before the invasion in, in and here, of course, uh, I recognize that the, it, there was invasion uh, in, in 2014, but, but here the invasion that I'll, I'll look at is the, the watershed is uh, 2022. And, and then I'll also talk about the 2014, but, but here the invasion, um, the inter intensification of the war against Ukraine refers to uh, uh, February uh, 2022. So I, I look at the situation before the um, invasion in, in 2022 and after, and I draw on my uh, previous studies um, for the before part. I mean, I have studied versus education diplomacy in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, and, and um, among other target countries. And uh, as uh, I, I showed in the previous slide, I have published three pieces on Russia's education diplomacy. And the last one of them is in the book that Anatoly also mentioned. Um, I mean, uh, a chapter in the book called Russia's Cultural Statecraft. And it is co-edited with my uh, colleague, Thomas Forsberg. And in this book, we um, look at different fields of culture as resources or tools uh, of foreign policy and use this notion of uh, cultural statecraft. And, and this book was uh, published in, in November 21. Uh, the publication date is 2022, but it was actually published in November 21. So all the research uh, for the book was made uh, well before the in uh, intensification of Russia's war against Ukraine in February 22. And when I have talked about uh, the role of international higher education in foreign policy, I have used the notion of education uh, uh, diplomacy. So for me, education diplomacy refers to, I quote, uh, uh, an activity in the internationalization of education in which the education provider has a political motivation and goal when promoting its higher education abroad, when recruiting international students or engaging in international academic collaboration. Uh, what then has uh, allowed me to claim that Russia has a, a political motivation and goal for internationalization of, of higher education? Uh, for my article published in, in 2016, uh, I studied the state level uh, discourse on interna uh, internationalization of higher education in Russia. I mean, uh, official documents, statements by, uh, made by the uh, authorities, I mean, political leaders, um, yeah, mainly political leaders. And I, I found out that there was indeed a political motivation. So Russia was uh, engaging with education diplomacy. So education diplomacy has to do with uh, socialization of future elite uh, elites of foreign countries, uh, aspiration to uh, make them uh, friends of your country, uh, to build a, a long-term connection with them, uh, perhaps making them dependent on, on your country. Um, also, definitely, it has to do with uh, the aspiration to improve the image of your country. Um, but of course, it does not mean uh, that this political rationale is the only uh, rationale, but, but there are other uh, motivations and, and goals, uh, such as socioeconomic uh, ones, um, for example, um, uh, training workforce for your labor market. And then there are, of course, uh, academic uh, rationales, 
uh, to invite talents, to improve the quality of research and education, to improve your standing in the global rankings and so on. So uh, what also made me to argue that Russia had a political motivation was that the main target area uh, for promotion of Russian higher education and recruitment of international students seem to be uh, uh, Commonwealth of independent states uh, countries. And, and this corresponds to the regional priority of Russia's foreign policy uh, in the 2000s. So Russia has tried to strengthen relations with those countries or to keep them in, uh, in their uh, in its uh, sphere of influence, uh, keep them dependent on, on Russia with all possible means. And there were, um, I mean, we have witnessed uh, also very aggressive politics even before the annexation of Crimea and the war in Eastern Ukraine in, in 2014. So there are plenty of examples of that uh, aggressive politics even before uh, 2014. And then we can look at the next. Slide, please. So um, after that, uh, that I had found uh, proof that that Russian authorities have plans of applying uh, international higher education for the purposes of their foreign policy, that they plan to engage with uh, education diplomacy. I wanted to find out uh, first whether this was something shared by university leaders in in, in Russian universities. And most importantly, uh, how this all was perceived in the target countries of Russia's education diplomacy. So I, I wanted to find out uh, how Russia promotes its higher education uh, abroad and, and recruits international students, and then how this is was seen in the target countries. Whether, I mean, whether Russia's claims about its role in, in global higher education. Um, have or could have any foundation, whether its higher education was respected and, and attractive as it claimed itself. So I, I studied first how Russian political leaders and university leaders represented the role of education in foreign policy, and then how it was implemented and perceived in the EU uh, and in the post-Soviet uh, post space. Uh, so I had um, cases, uh, country cases, uh, in which I contacted um, expert interviews with, with I mean, experts in, in higher education or international higher education. Um, so in the last publication, uh, I had uh, country cases. Uh, uh, as my country cases, I had Germany, Finland, and Latvia uh, to represent the EU member states and uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan to represent the post-Soviet uh, space. Uh, so I co conducted uh, semi-structured interviews uh, with education providers in, in Moscow, vice rectors, deputy vice rectors, deputy deans, heads of deputy, uh, heads or deputy heads of Russian uh, University International branch campuses, um, heads of international office uh, or international affairs departments, uh, and the heads of uh, relevant research centers. And then I also had uh, interviews in, in, in so-called target countries, vice rectors, heads of international affair, uh, affairs departments, professors and uh, associate professors and administrators in universities, heads or coordinators of particular agencies in the field of uh, quality assurance or academic mobility. And, and what my overall conclusion uh, was, cannot go into details here, um, was that Russia did not have any visible uh, education diplomacy in the EU. Uh, in general, there was very little demand for Russian higher education, or it was in some specific fields uh, like uh, performative arts or those fields that uh, had to do with uh, Russia itself. I mean, those who were interested in, in, in studying something Russian, I mean, mean, Russian language or Russian literature, uh, of course there was, uh, I mean, uh, demand for that kind of education for uh, very uh, 
well, niche fields, you can say. Well, in, in contrast then uh, in Belarus, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, it was another story. Uh, so Russia was a significant uh, education provider, significant actor in their higher education, mainly by recruiting uh, students to their universities, uh, to Russia, but also to joint universities or branch campuses of, of Russian universities in those countries. So uh, my, my interviewees, uh, they talked about uh, aggressive recruitment uh, policies, for example, um, and, and there are many other uh, interesting examples that they gave about uh, the way that uh, Russia um, competed for, for their students and, and tried to attract them to go and study in, in Russia. Well, you can read more about that in the book. It is now available in, in open access. So we can uh, move on to the next slide. So uh, before going to my current research agenda, uh, I wanted to show you um, a couple of figures. Uh, first, about the number of international students. Uh, the number uh, was indeed increasing in, in 2010s, and uh, Russia was and, and still is um, among the key education uh, providers uh, worldwide. So this figure tells about this increase in the number of international students, and we can look at the next figure. And, and this is to show you uh, uh, about where uh, international degree seeking students uh, come from uh, to, to Russian universities. And as we can see here, um, they mainly come from the uh, uh, Commonwealth of Independent States and also uh, from different countries in, in uh, Asia. So this is the situation in 2018. So uh, the other regions uh, countries in other regions are really uh, not that significant if we look at the numbers uh, that, uh, I mean, from where uh, international students to Russia come. And we can move then to the next slide. Uh, then finally, um, to my ongoing research. So uh, I, I continue discussing the role of Russia as a provider in, uh, in, in global higher education. And the focus uh, on, is on the perspective of Kazakhstan and, and Kyrgyzstan. And, and Kazakhstan, in particular Kazakhstan, but, but also Kyrgyzstan have been among the main uh, source countries uh, for international students in, in Russian higher education since the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union. So of course, then they kind of um, changed into international students uh, after after the collapse. And uh, Central Asia also uh, makes up part of the space which uh, represents uh, the priority in, in Russia's uh, foreign policy. And as we know, um, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has made uh, many of its former or still current um, partners uh, rethink Russia's role in, in world politics and whether Russia can be taken as a partner for a socioeconomic development, as a credible uh, trade partner, uh, energy supplier, or as a provider of, of security. Therefore, I, I think it's crucial also uh, to, um, to ask what this all means to, to Russia's role uh, as a higher education provider in, in Central Asia. And, and here in, in particular, as I mentioned quite many times, Kazakhstan and, and Kyrgyzstan. So I am interested in how, uh, how if at all, uh, Russia's position or role changed after Russia intensified uh, its, uh, its war against Ukraine in February 22. So if Russia was an attractive destination for Kazakhstani and Kyrgyzstani students in the 2010s, ha has the situation changed? And, and what I uh, plan to find out is whether Russia's own um, narrative as a global uh, higher education provider has changed after the invasion 
how it has been adapted to, uh, to the new uh, circumstances. So I'll look at so-called Russia's view. And, and then I will look at this from the perspective of uh, uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, how Russia's role is represented, how have the push and, and pull factors in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, um, I mean, whether they have changed or whether they will likely to change in the, in the near future. And then I, I look at the bigger picture, uh, whether and how these are linked with the world political situation, uh, in particular Russia's aggression against Ukraine. And we can have a look at the next slide. And, and this change is, um, is studied based on the comparison on the findings from the data gathered before and after the invasion in, in 22. So I'm reflecting here also the findings from my previous uh, studies. And conceptually, my paper will draw on the literature on education diplomacy, as well as uh, the push uh, and pull model uh, on the macro level. And, and uh, you can see here that the, my uh, studies based on the expert interviews, I mean, those that I conducted for my previous studies uh, in, in 2017 and, and 2018, and then uh, fresh interviews in, in gathered in uh, 22 and, and 23 uh, in uh, Almaty, Astana, and Bishkek, and I'm also online. And in addition, I use materials from the website of the uh, Ministry of Higher Education in, in Kyrgyzstan and the Polonia Center in Kazakhstan, and, and also media materials, official documents. And for Russia's position after the invasion, I look at the materials from the website of the Ministry of um, Higher Education and Science and the Telegram channel uh, of uh, Russian House. Uh, these are maintained by uh, Rasa Satrunicheskva, that is an agency under the foreign ministry, the main public diplomacy actor in, in, in Russia. And then as for the relations uh, between the, these states, I look at previous studies, media materials and public, uh, public opinion polls. And then we can have a look at the next slide. Yes, so uh, I, I will not make a literature review here as part of my um, presentation, but would still like to mention that I acknowledge that there is a huge amount of studies on, on internationalization of higher education, uh, uh, of Russian higher education, and, and some of them also stress political nature or, or geopolitical nature of, of Russia's activities in the field, for example, Maya Chantelliani's research and about internationalization of Russian higher education, I'd like to mention for example, Svetlana Shenderova's work. And, and there are also studies on, on higher education in Central Asia, but not that many focusing on external actors in the field of higher education in Central Asia. And I think there has been and still is a research gap. And of course, my interest is broader than just Russia's role. Uh, in the future, I plan to study uh, interaction between local and external actors, I mean, several different external actors in, in higher education in, in Central Asia. And hopefully I will be able to do that in collaboration with scholars from or based in, in Central Asia. And we can move on to the next one. I, I think I'll um, probably skip this for, to save some time, but I, just say a couple of things. Um, I mean, because as one of my question in, in my uh, research agenda is how um, have the push and pull factors uh, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan for studies in Russian higher education evolved, uh, if at all, uh, I will also draw on, on the push and pull model um, or adapt uh, it to my research. And, and this, uh, model was originally used in migration studies and, and then uh, applied to study uh, international student flows. And, and um, the most cited source perhaps uh, is um, for the push and pull model is that of uh, Mazarol and Zutar from 2002. And, and uh, I, I adapt their, their model uh, to, to my own purposes. Um, so uh, what I can say is that, uh, uh, as you will see in the next slide, is that almost 
all pull factors mentioned by Mazaro and Sultar used to work for the benefit of uh, uh, Russia in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And, and here you can see these uh, factors. So what I can argue based on the findings of my previous studies uh, is that the motivation of Kazakhstani and, and uh, Kyrgyzstani students to go and study in Russia or in Russian higher education institutions has had to do uh, with uh, both economic, academic, uh, social and, and cultural factors. So one of the most important uh, pull factor was economic. I mean that Russian higher education, uh, Russian higher education institutions uh, were able to offer free education or education with a low or affordable uh, tuition fees. Uh, in addition, Russia's uh, labor market um, looked uh, attractive compared to the labor market in, in their, own, uh, their home countries. And academic factor was also important. Uh, first, that their qualifications were recognized in Russia, I mean, 11 year uh, schooling, and, and there was no need to take the test required by their home countries. And also there was an idea that, uh, that the quality of education in Russia was higher than in their home country and that their future decree uh, would be recognized not only in Russia and in their home countries, but, but more broadly in, in Europe. And also the language issue was important. I mean, opportunity to study in uh, Russia for those who did not have skills uh, of English. So in my uh, ongoing research, I ask how these uh, particular pull factors uh, have changed after the start of the full-scale war uh, against Ukraine. And now we can move on to the next slide, please. So um, before going to the role of uh, Russia, as it is represented in Kazakhstan and, and Yukistan, a couple of words about how Russia represents itself as to internationalization and, and their role in, in global higher education. And um, what they attempt to do is to say that uh, we continue internationalization of higher education, we offer high, high quality of education, conduct high level uh, research, and it is, they say, uh, mutually beneficial to collaborate with us to send students to Russian universities. Now, of course, what they do is that they uh, collaborate only with so-called friendly states and uh, orientate mainly to Asia and Middle East and to some, to some extent to, to Africa. Um, Latin America is sometimes mentioned as well. And uh, as Maya Chancelliani from the University of Oxford has stated, the turn to collaboration with Chinese universities took place already before the invasion in, in, in February 22. And in particular, Siberian universities have been very active in forming ties with uh, universities in Asia in the past too. And then what kind of collaboration there is or what they claim to have, uh, it is about student recruitment, about opening new branch campuses, um, also having scientific collaboration, uh, offering online education. Um, they are also very active in, in, in uh, training Russian teachers abroad, organizing events to them. And um, then if we think about the figures um, for current numbers of, of international students, it, it is not easy to find reliable uh, data. I mean, um, there used to be some uh, publications uh, by the ministry, uh, but I've not been able to find uh, any fresher than from uh, 2020. And UNESCO data is uh, dates back to uh, 2019. So uh, we have to kind of rely on what the ministry says in, in public, for example. And, and, and in the slide, you can see one of the versions of, of statistics. Uh, Vedomosti Journal, for example, gave slightly different figures than uh, referring to the ministry figures, but, but more or less the countries are the same. So Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, China, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, India would be those sending most international students to Russia. 
Uh, then again, if we look at the uh, uh, minister saying that uh, that uh, actually that actually um, the countries would come in the uh, order of Egypt, then China, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Belarus, and also uh, trying to uh, convince us that uh, they expect to have as many or even more foreign students for the next academic year than uh, this academic year. So, but we do not have reliable data on, on, on that. And we can move on to the next, next one, please. Uh, then what kind of collaboration there is with, with Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan? Uh, well, for example, um, Russia has opened new branch campuses in, in, in Kazakhstan. For example, the uh, National Research um, University, Nuclear University, uh, MIFI, has opened a branch uh, in, in, in Almaty. Uh, and there are many other Russian universities that plan, have such plans. Um, and, and then if we look at Kyrgyzstan, uh, for example, uh, there have been a, a second forum of rectors of Russian and Kyrgyzstan universities it was held there uh, last year with, with uh, 100 rectors participating and, and representatives from the ministries as well. And also the education fair, education in Russia was held in, in Bishkek. And we can move on to the next slide, please. Then about how this situation is, is uh, seen in, in Kazakhstan. Well, the two um, main arguments that I can draw from the Kazakhstani data are that first, there have been changes both within Kazakhstan and outside it, and they both have impact on uh, whether Russia is still seen as an attractive provider of, of higher education. And the second one is that the pull factors that were there before the invasion in, in 22 are still valid, but for a smaller uh, amount of students. Uh, before looking at those uh, arguments more closely, uh, I, I should say that all my interviewees uh, were convinced that in the future there will be fewer uh, students from Kazakhstan to Russia. So the first argument is about change, that there has definitely been a change. And uh, the first reason for, for the change has, had started already before the invasion in 2022 and, and already before the pandemic as well. I mean, internal developments in, in, in uh, Kazakhstan in the field of higher education. And uh, this change um, will uh, intensify uh, then because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in, in 2022. So internal developments, this had to do with the reform of, of Kazakhstani uh, education starting in 2018. And, and this reform was characterized, uh, for example, as a liberalization of higher education. It meant that uh, state universities uh, had more freedom uh, to decide themselves about their curricula and um, to offer uh, more alternatives to students, I mean, new programs, for example. And there is now also the, uh, the concept of development of higher education and science for 23-29. Uh, uh, and there are more and more goals in the field of uh, internationalization of higher education. So uh, the higher education field has also changed uh, because um, there are more international branch campuses and a dual degrees uh, with foreign universities. So uh, these are the changes that have uh, changed the uh, push factors uh, for, uh, for uh, Kazakhstani students. So they are fewer. Uh, fewer uh, push, uh, push factors, I mean, to leave uh, Kazakhstan and, and go to study abroad. We can have a look at the next slide. So uh, I wanted to show you a, a map of Kazakhstan, and this is uh, the, uh, from the presentation of the minister. And, and here you can see um, the plans for new international branch campuses. Uh, marked with blue are those that have already uh, been opened, 
so uh, to Russian uh, ones, and, and then also branch campus of Arizona State University. And with green, uh, you can see those that uh, should be or have been opened or will be opened uh, this year. So uh, there is a branch campus from the UK, from a uni UK university, a university from Turkey, Uzbekistan, uh, Korea, uh, Kazakh German University. And then there are also those uh, planned by uh, 2029, uh, marked with orange. So this also tells about the changes as to push factors. And we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, and, and then if we think about the uh, pull factors, we can see that there are more negative pull factors, or let, let's call them uh, push away factors or constraining factors. And, and the most significant, uh, significant of them has to do with security concerns. Um, so uh, Russia is a war raging country, and this has its effects uh, on, on security also inside the country. So the interviewees, they referred to the cases of explosions of pumps uh, here and there in, in Russia, and rhetorically asked how anyone could uh, send their child to a country uh, which, which is in, in war. And generally, um, or, or general uncertainty uh, is certainly a, a push away factor. Uh, I mean, nobody knows what is happening or what will happen in Russia in the near future. And, and this is a factor that makes uh, parents to rethink whether it would be a good decision to send their children to do Russia. There's also the political factor. I mean, normative position, uh, not accepting the war. Uh, this was mentioned. And, and, and also the fear of Russia attacking, uh, attacking Kazakhstan. But according to the experts that I uh, interviewed, this was not the main push away factor, but rather this had to do with the, uh, uh, those that I already mentioned, I mean, security and uncertainty. For example, it was argued that the authoritarian system in, in, in uh, Russia had not stopped parents sending their children to Russia in the past either. Uh, of course, a repressive system inside a country and aggression towards say, another country are not the same, uh, even though in Russia's case, uh, these are closely uh, connected with each other. What was also mentioned uh, was a bad reputation of the country because of the war and worries about the recognition of Russian decrees in the future. And, and we can have a look at the next slide here, please. But then again, here too, we can see that Kazakhstan is a divided society as to their attitude towards Russia and, and Russia's war against Ukraine. So the experts argued that those pull factors that, uh, in play before the invasion in 22 are still there in particular for those students who uh, are not fluent in English, who live in, in rural places uh, close to the Russian border. Uh, so the flow of students from Kazakhstan to Russia will not stop even if it will decrease, they argued. Uh, and they also pointed out to, to the uh, huge propaganda machine that Russia has. I mean, Russian TV, for example, for older generations, um, and uh, both in Ibn Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan news and entertainment provided by Russian media are used by more than 60% of the population. And uh, of course, we also know, as I already mentioned, that two Russian universities were opened in, in uh, 2022. Uh, the decisions were made before February 2022, but, but they still continue uh, discussion with, with more universities, and, and, and there are already uh, six uh, branch campuses of Russian universities there. Uh, but the interviews also uh, emphasize that Kazakhstan is in a better position uh, as to Russia. I mean, they can choose uh, with whom to collaborate. Uh, and for example, what kind of branches to welcome to, to uh, Kazakhstan. For example, Kazakhstan needs expertise for the new uh, nuclear power plant. 
So having a branch of uh, MIFI in, in Kazakhstan will benefit this purpose. And then next slide, uh, slide please. All right. And then uh, for Kyrgyzstan, it seems that the push factors have not changed in the same way as in Kazakhstan. I mean, the push factors have not diminished. Uh, uh, there is still discussion about the low quality of, of uh, education, for example, because of the uh, over uh, commercialization of higher education. I mean, universities have to rely on, on, on revenues from tuition fees. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are not enough of scholarships for students, and, and they are concentrated on STEM fields. So this is one of the main uh, um, motivations, uh, push factors for study abroad. Uh, now it was also argued that there are more and more opportunities for study abroad also in Europe, because there, there are new providers of scholarship, uh, scholarships also for Kyrgyzstan students. So, Russia is no longer the only options for those looking for higher education without tuition fees. And this will also change in the future when basic education will take uh, 12 years instead of 11 years. And this will give uh, better uh, opportunities uh, to search for a place to study abroad. So Russia will lose this competitive advantage that it has had in, in, the, uh, in the past. And then we can have a look at the next slide. Then if we look at the Russia's uh, pull factors, it seems that the same pull factors are still there. And one which has probably dropped from the list is the citizenship. I mean, that is uh, one of the pull factors uh, used to be that you could acquire the Russian citizenship with all the benefits after you graduate from a Russian university. But now with the war and, and mobilization, this is, uh, I was assured that this is no longer any pull factor. So um, one less there. However, just like in Kazakhstan, security, security concerns and, and, and uncertainty were mentioned as those factors that might uh, reduce the willingness to, to go to Russia for studies. But this was only for minority, um, the, uh, the interviewees argued. And, and uh, but one uh, more constraining factor uh, is that in the past, Russia was also seen as an opportunity to have European experience. I mean, Russian universities had many double degrees with European partners, or they had agreements or student exchange. And this was something that also attracted students from Kyrgyzstan. And as there is no uh, this opportunity anymore, then um, this might, diminish interest towards studies in the Russian universities. And, and then we can move on. I, I think I don't have much time anymore. So um, maybe I'll just say a couple of things about this. So uh, about, um, about the uh, geopolitical context in which uh, higher education uh, operates. So, um, if we look at the official level of uh, relations between uh, Russia and, and uh, the two countries, uh, they are rethinking their relationship um, with Russia and, and searching for new, new uh, partners for economic development and security cooperation as well. In particular, I mean, China, Turkey and the US. I mean, there have been several uh, meetings with representatives of these countries, and this follows the, uh, their publicly declared multi-vector foreign policy. Um, there have also been worries about Russia's plans vis-a-vis -vis northern Kazakhstan, for example, after the annexation of Crimea, uh, Putin had denied uh, the history of statehood of Kazakhstan uh, prior to the post-Soviet uh, independence. And there were also, um, for example, blog posts of Medvedev along those lines, uh, but later uh, eliminated and, and explained that it was a post made by a hacker. Anyway, uh, I mean, Kazakhstan is worried about its security and, and invasion of, of uh, Russia, and, and uh, also thinking whether um, Russia in general can any longer guarantee security in, in Central Asia. And, and whether it can be seen as a reliable trade partner or supplier of energy. Uh, I think we need to go to the next, uh, next slide. 
uh, yes, uh, about what, what I can say here very briefly is that uh, the public opinion in, in Giristan and Kazakhstan is very divided as to, um, as to Russia and, and the war, uh, Russia's war against uh, Ukraine. Uh, so what we can see here is that in Kyrgyzstan there is more support for the war and for Russia uh, than in Kazakhstan. And, and um, of course there are uh, differences between different age groups, uh, younger tend to support uh, uh, Ukraine, older uh, Russia and, and so on. But uh, I mean, the, the society is really divided as to this matter. And we can move on to the next slide. And, and uh, we can also assume that the official foreign policy of these countries and the public opinion are influenced or conditioned uh, by uh, the huge dependencies that these two countries uh, have on Russia. And, and uh, as some analysts have pointed out, um, that even if Russia's uh, influence is diminishing in, in Central Asia, Russia continues to have leverage especially on, on, over countries such as Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, which are heavily dependent on, on remittances. Uh, so trade relations, Russian investments, depends, uh, dependence on transit routes and energy pipelines are those that will help Russia maintain its influence. And there are also cultural ties, uh, Soviet legacies, and so on. Um, so therefore, I think uh, what was repeated by higher education experts based in both, in both countries, as well as in, in, in many previous studies, is that Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan do not have the choice of not having at least some kind of uh, relations with, with Russia at the moment. And their official position has to be that of neutrality. Um, the public opinion also follows this uh, neutrality line. So uh, these countries should be uh, offered uh, alternatives better alternatives by the EU and the US if they are to diminish uh, these uh, dependencies. Uh, okay, then I'll look at the conclusions very, very shortly. The next slide, it will have that one. So, uh, so the two uh, arguments that I want to conclude with is that uh, first we, we have to be aware of the fact that states, also those with authoritarian regimes, attempt to use uh, international higher education uh, as a tool in their foreign uh, policy. And second, that in the field of higher education, the choice with whom to collaborate is influenced or conditioned uh, by the political geopolitical environment. So what are the opportunities and, and what kind of collaboration the decision makers uh, uh, encourage to. And, and sometimes the choice uh, to collaborate or not to collaborate, collaborate is a political decision, not only motivated by academic or economic reasoning, but, but political reasoning, and normative reasoning. I will not go to the summarizing my, my findings here. Uh, I, all what I want to say to, to conclude is that uh, as to how, how I continue my studies, so I will try to uh, make a deeper analysis of the materials, perhaps scatter some more materials if required, and of course to familiarize myself uh, with uh, more recent research on, on these topics. And, and of course, it's too early to, to uh, draw any definite conclusions. Um, I mean, there has been a, a bit more than a year from the start of this uh, or intensification of this new invasion and um, but I am sure that uh, in the in the futures uh, in the future uh, the changes in the geopolitical situation will have their impact also on higher education. But we do not yet know for sure what kind of effort, um, what kind of effect these these uh, changes will have in, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And we can have a look at the next slide where I say that uh, this is a work in progress, and I welcome all all. Uh, questions and, and comments and any ideas that you might have um, how to, to continue this research. So thank you very much for your attention.